trust you have your Bibles there this morning, and if you do, please turn with me to the book of Revelation and chapter 19. The book of Revelation, chapter 19, we reach this morning the pinnacle, what we could say is the pinnacle, the high point of the book of Revelation, and in many ways, one of the, uh, the mountain peaks of Scripture. Uh, all Scripture is valuable, all Scripture is profitable, but there are those majestic mountain peaks in the Word of God. And Revelation 19 is certainly one of those where we reach this great theme of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been building towards this in the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation is the unfolding, the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in particular, uh, the truths concerning his return. And so uh, I trust that you have your Bible there. And we're going to read from verse 1 all the way to the end of the chapter. And we're going to actually uh, study the chapter in two messages. As I prepared it, uh, with the view to doing one message, I realised we had two. So we're going to spend a whole day today in Revelation 19. So you should have an outline to follow there. And we'll get about halfway through that this morning. And then, Lord willing, tonight we will finish the other half. So come back tonight uh, to hear the Word of God again. A reminder also, for those who may not be aware, all of our sermons are uploaded to our website. We have videos available, uh, usually within a day or two of Sunday. Uh, Audio is available straight after the service. And also we do upload a PDF of all the notes as well for the series. So you can go back through if you're looking to study in further detail. All right, reading from verse 1, Revelation 19. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up for ever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. <clears throat> and I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren which have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven opened, <clears throat> Excuse me, and behold, a white horse. Sorry. <clears throat> and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written which no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean." And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves under the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies 
gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that, wore, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that had worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the sacred word that is before us. And Lord, as we sang before, we do ask that you would break the bread of life to us. Uh, Lord, how we are conscious of our need as we come before you this morning. The preacher has needs. The people have needs. Lord, we are dependent upon you to take the bread of life, to take the word of God and with your own hands to break it and to um, make it digestible for us and make it understandable to us. So Lord, we pray that you would help the speaker today, that he would be able to speak your word with, uh, with clarity and with clearness and with, with boldness. We pray also, Lord, for uh, any today who may not know Christ as Saviour, I pray, Lord, that you would work in their hearts and uh, stir them up by your spirit and draw them to yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We now reach the climax of the book of Revelation in a very real sense, and also to a certain degree, the climax of all human history. There is a note of great triumph, isn't there, and victory that rings right through this passage. We have the passage opening with those words, Alleluia, four times over. Alleluia, the only time that word appears in the New Testament, four times, and it is found all in this one chapter. So there is a great note of victory, a great, great note of triumph, because the kingdom, the empire of Antichrist has finally collapsed under the weight of the mighty judgment of God. And now uh, King Jesus is about to break through the sky and into this world scene. He's going to take up his rightful place as king and ruler upon this earth. Now the chapter divides into two main sections and uh, this will form the basis of our two messages today. In verse 1 through 10, we have the worship that takes place in heaven over the fall of Babylon or the Antichrist Empire. You remember from our two previous messages in this book that, uh, that Babylon or the kingdom of Antichrist has both a religious element and it has an economic element. The religious aspect of Babylon is described in Revelation 17, the great harlot, the great whore. And then the economic aspect is described in Revelation chapter 18. <clears throat> Well, we come now to the rejoicing over that fall. And then we have in verses 11 through 21, the description of the second coming of Christ. And so we have this worship scene that takes place immediately preceding the return of Christ. Then we have the return of Christ described for us uh, um, specifically. Now, the second coming of Christ is a major theme of the scriptures. Look at this. There are around 1,800 prophecies of Christ's second coming in the Old Testament. To put that in perspective, for every one prophecy about the first coming of Christ, there are approximately eight prophecies about the second coming of Christ. That's significant, isn't it? I mean, how precious to us is the first coming of Christ when he first came to this earth. But do you realise for every prophecy in the Old Testament concerning Christ's first coming, we have eight prophecies concerning his second coming. That tells me the second coming is a very important theme in Scripture. A very important message, sadly neglected by much of Christendom today. And so we want to emphasise that today. In the New Testament, there are around 300 references to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is a magnificent and a prominent theme in the Bible. Well, here's our outline for our lessons today. We're going to be looking at number one, the worship before his coming in verses one through six. Number two, the wedding before his coming, verses seven through 10. And that'll be this morning's message, those first two points. And then Lord willing tonight, we'll look number three at the wonder of his coming, verses 11 to 16. And then the war at his coming, verses 17 to 21. <clears throat> Bible teacher J. Vernon McGee mentions that chapter 19 of Revelation, quote, marks a dramatic change in the tone of Revelation. 
The destruction of Babylon, the capital of the beast kingdom, marks the end of the great tribulation. The somber gives way to song. The transfer is from darkness to light, from black to white, from dreary days of judgment to bright days of blessing. This chapter makes a definite division in Revelation and ushers in the greatest event for this earth, the second coming of Christ. It is the bridge between the great tribulation and the millennium. Wonderful quote there. Well, let's get into our outline this morning as we get into the chapter. Notice firstly, please, what we would call the worship that takes place right before his second coming in verses one through six. Now, there are four Alleluia's that are in this section. And I'd encourage you, if you have a pen in your Bible, to find them and underline them. Four Alleluia's. Uh, but I discern two main themes that these divide into. Okay, the first one is Alleluia, God is righteous. Alleluia, God is righteous. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power unto the Lord our God for true and righteous are his judgments. God's judgments are true and righteous. You know, one thing that's really struck me about the study of the book of Revelation is the tremendous emphasis upon worship. Uh, that's been one of the main takeaways for me from the study of this book. Amongst other things, it is absolutely amazing as, as we get a glimpse into the worship of heaven. And what we find, don't we, uh, that he we find is that heaven's worship is focused upon God, who he is, what he has done, the greatness of God, the power of God, the saving work of God. And so this is the first great theme, the first great alleluia. God is righteous. Notice the, what I would call the anthem of their worship, the anthem of their worship in verses one through three there. Um, <clears throat> and that's what we're talking about here, the focus upon the Lord. We notice there's great reverence and respect in their praise in verse one. Uh, alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power. Now you say, what, is the word, what does the word alleluia actually mean? Well, it's the Greek equivalent to the Old Testament phrase, praise ye the Lord. Have you come across that phrase in the book of Psalms before? Okay, that phrase, praise ye the Lord or praise ye Jehovah, comes from the Hebrew word hallelujah. Okay, so we have hallelujah in the Old Testament, which means praise the Lord. We have hallelujah in the New Testament, which means praise the Lord. Now, what's very interesting to me about this word hallelujah is its basic meaning is to be bright. And uh, I read this in, I thought this was good, that in essence, what this means is to illuminate the Lord by casting a bright light on him and his works. That's a good definition, isn't it? What does it mean to worship the Lord? When we say hallelujah, we're saying praise be to God. Well, when we worship God, we are casting a bright light, as it were, upon Him and His works. What is true worship? Well, true worship is when you get out of the spotlight and you put Christ in the spotlight, if I could say that reverently. Okay, and that's important we understand that this morning because the praise and worship movement that is out there that is sweeping the Christian world and, and just taking over churches doesn't really resemble in many respects the kind of worship we find in the Bible. True worship focuses in upon God. Now there's a place for personal testimony and we sing that about the fact that we have been redeemed, that we have been born again, but the primary emphasis of true worship is not me, it's not my feelings, it's not about I am this and I am that, it's about the great I am, it's about Christ. Very important. So worship is to shine a light on Christ and what he's done. That's what the word hallelujah means. Then we have the word salvation. Can you see what they're worshipping God about here? Salvation. That's a great theme for worship, isn't it? Who is the author of salvation? Jesus Christ. Uh, salvation is all because of what God has done. And so this is a great theme for worship. They're viewing God as the author and the, the giver of salvation. 
glory. We understand that all glory belongs to God and that He is worthy to be glorified. Honour, power, all power belongs to God. What awesome power God has. The power to create, the power to speak and worlds come into existence. So we notice the respect of their praise there. We also notice the reasons for their praise. In verse 2, there are two reasons given why they are worshipping God and it is introduced there by the word for. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. So they're worshipping God in this context for two things. Number one, because God has judged the great whore. Now, taking your mind back to our previous lesson, do you remember what happened when Babylon fell? What happened as far as earth's inhabitants were concerned? Did they rejoice? Were they rejoicing or what were they doing? Mourning. Okay, but here we have heaven's perspective on what's happening on earth. Okay, from man's perspective, unsaved man's perspective, when this world system collapses, so does all his hopes, all his dreams, everything he imagined. It's all bound up in this world system. But from heaven's perspective, it's a wonderful thing that Satan's kingdom has finally come to an end. I tell you what, if you're saved this morning, aren't you looking forward to the day when Satan, as the God of this world, will reign no longer? <laughs> Aren't you looking forward to the day where there will be the collapse of sin and wickedness and this world system that is so opposed to God and to his word? That's cause for rejoicing. Yeah. You know, we need to have heaven's perspective on things, don't we, in relation to this world. We need to see things from a heavenly perspective by God's grace and with his word as our guide. So they're praising him for that, that God has judged the great whore. But there's a second reason in verse 2. They're also praising him because God has avenged his servants and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Uh, Babylon, this picture of the system of this world with its religious and political faces, has been a great persecutor of God's people from its beginning all the way through the Dark Ages. And then obviously what's in view here is this future great persecution of Christians, of tribulation saints, the people who will be saved during the tribulation period. And so there's great rejoicing because God has given justice for what has taken place. God has avenged his servants. Then in verse 3, we have the repetition of their praise. So we have the... <coughs> Um, there's some reverence in their praise, salvation, glory, honour, power. There's reasons for their praise, verse 2 there. And now there's repetition of praise in verse 3. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And so the word is repeated again for emphasis. And we have this vivid picture of the city that is in ruins. And uh, we showed this picture last time in our last message, but <clears throat> the, the, the smoke is pictured as rising up, a vivid picture of the fact that this headquarters of Antichrist have been burned up. But there's something interesting in the verse. It says <clears throat> in verse 3, her smoke rose up forever and ever. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, I believe that the actual burning up of the city itself will be temporal. But what the Bible is doing here is showing us that there is, it's hinting at the eternal damnation of the city's inhabitants, I believe. We're getting very close in the, chat, in, in the book of Revelation now to a description of the lake of fire, which is a place of eternal torment. And so, as one writer puts it here, Robert Thomas, he says, the flames that destroy the physical city will, of course, burn out in due time, yet beyond this song must view the eternal fate of individuals intimately connected with the city. Understand that this morning. The Bible teaches very plainly that there is an eternal hell for those who do not trust Christ. It may not be a popular teaching today. It may run against uh, the way people uh, are super sensitive today about a God, God being a God of justice and God being a God of judgment. But make no mistake about it this morning, for those who reject Christ, a burning lake awaits. A burning torment awaits. And that's why God sent Jesus Christ to 
redeem you, to give you an opportunity to receive his gift before it is too late. And so we have the anthem of their worship. Then we notice the affirmation of their worship in verse 4. <clears throat> and the four <clears throat> and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. So this is a word of affirmation. What's happening? There's a great multitude there in heaven and they're singing before the throne. There's this, these great words of worship going towards the throne. Salvation, glory, honour, power under the Lord our God. The four and twenty elders, the twenty-four elders and the four beasts respond and say, Amen, Alleluia. That's a word of affirmation. What does the word Amen mean? It, it, mean, it means it is so. I agree. Now, if they say amen in heaven as a part of the worship up there, may I suggest you're allowed to say amen in the local church too. Amen. I think it's a great thing, okay, for you to affirm the truth. Now, I've seen excesses, of course. I remember going to a fellowship meeting once and there's a young man up in the balcony. He was clearly seeking attention to himself, just about throwing himself off the balcony, yelling so loud. We don't need that, okay? But if your heart is touched by the worship of God and you say, yes, I agree with that. Yes, that's what the word of God says. It's totally biblical for you to say, amen. OK, amen. Very good. Amen. Hallelujah. There's a voice of agreement there to the worship that is offered. <clears throat> we notice time and time again, don't we, the posture of heaven's worship. We don't see this concept of lifting myself up in the presence of God, waving my arms up in the presence of God, jumping up in the presence of God, dancing in the presence of God. You want to know how they worship in heaven? They're down on their faces. They're kneeling before the throne. There's a great sense of awe and reverence. And by the way, you find in the Bible when men were confronted with the majesty and the glory of God, they didn't fall backwards, they fell forward. <laughs> what do we see in the charismatic church today? H hands up, falling backwards, slain in the spirit. Ah, in the New Testament, they fell forward. In the Bible, they fell forward in reverence to the Lord. The only time I can think of just offhand where people fell backwards was, was, was when Christ was in the garden and those thugs came to arrest him they, and he said, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. And they were thrown back in the power of God and fell backwards. But that wasn't a word. They weren't there to worship him. <laughs> So that's the first great theme of worship here. Hallelujah. God is righteous. True and righteous are his judgments. You need to remember that. When we read in the Bible about the severity of God, how God judges the wicked, we must never have in our mind the thought that God is somehow unjust, that God's judgments are unfair or unjust in any way. No, they are true and righteous in every way. That brings us to the second uh, alleluia or second theme I discern. Alleluia, God is reigning. Alleluia, God is righteous. Alleluia, God is reigning. <clears throat> and a voice came out of the throne, verse 5, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So can you see that really there's a progression happening here? The worship is building in the temple of God, in the, in, in the heavenly Jerusalem there, as the, as the, the words of praise uh, are, are, are directed towards the throne of God. There's a voice of command now in verse 5 that comes out from the throne, a call to worship. Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. You know that worship is, a, is something that's commanded. We are actually commanded to praise the Lord. Having a difficult time this week, start praising the Lord. Having a tough time at work, start thanking the Lord. Uh, feel a bit tired from up with the kids, thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. Worship the Lord. It's a biblical thing for the people of God to be aroused, to be called to the worship of God. And so this great voice peels out 
from the throne, apparently from God himself. God is worthy to require our worship and to request it of us. The call to worship, we have the sound of the worship. What awesome sounds are involved here. There's, it sound, as John describes it, he said, it sounded as the voice of a great multitude. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Can you imagine being in heaven one day with the redeemed of all the ages? Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Can you, we will need glorified bodies to cope with the experience. I, I, I believe that. I, I believe that if we were there in our sinful bodies, the sound would kill us. We would die. I mean, just the, the awesomeness of, the, of this worship of God, this great multitude before the throne. As the voice of many waters, have you ever heard perhaps the crash of waves upon a beach? Or have you maybe heard the roar of a great waterfall? That's what John uses to describe this mighty sound, this roaring sound, this powerful sound. You know, you get a, a crowd together all shouting and it's a powerful feeling, powerful sensation. How many of you have been in a large crowd that's cheering? Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely electrifying. But, but that's nothing compared to this. We're talking about the redeemed of the ages, the saints of God before the throne with glorified, uh, glorified there and able to, to worship God in a great way. So the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thunderings. Heard the crash of thunder? It's awesome, isn't it? It's powerful. It's a, a majestic sound. It's a... Uh, it's, a, it's a powerful sound. Heaven's not a very quiet place, is it? <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, I'm not talking about worldly noise. We, we, we preach against that here. We don't want crash bang um, that sounds like the nightclub down the road and that pulsating beat. We don't want that sort of noise, but we do want a joyful noise in the house of God. We do want to sing with all of our hearts. I tell you what, when you really start to stop and think about the hymns and the words you're singing, it starts to really thrill you. I was greatly encouraged and greatly challenged by this when we were doing this counselling course at the moment and, and Brother Jim Berg talked about how that you can worship while you're singing. He said you can worship while you're hearing a message. Yes, Lord, thank you, you saved me. Yes, Lord, thank you for that truth that was, yes, that's so true. Thank you, Lord. And, and you know, I, I, f I feel like for myself, it's been a great blessing of late as I sing the hymns to try and actually speak to the Lord in my heart as we're singing the hymns. Thank you, Lord, that I'm washed in the blood. Yes, Lord, I'm washed. Thank you for that. And, and you start to do that and you start to praise the Lord and to worship the Lord. Sound of the worship. The theme of the worship. What is the theme? Look at verse 6. Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That's a great theme, isn't it? God on his throne. God has always been on his throne. Aren't you thankful that he will never be unseated? He's not there by popular vote. It doesn't matter how many in the world vote against him. He cannot be unseated. He cannot be impeached. Christ is upon the throne and he is there ruling and reigning. Don't be too discouraged this morning. God is on the throne. You say, I'm going through a trial. God is on the throne. God is on the throne. God is on the throne in relation to the events in your life. If you are walking with him, if you're a child of God, nothing happens by accident. He is the sovereign king upon the throne. Take courage this morning. Look away from your circumstances and your discouragements and remember that seated on that throne is God. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So what does the word omnipotent mean? Well, it simply means almighty. It means possessing in possession of unlimited power. That's a, a cause of praise, isn't it? God is on the throne and he has unlimited power. That challenge you're facing right now, it might seem too big for you, but God's power is well able to meet that challenge. God's power is enough working through you and working on your behalf. And so this is the great theme. Now, of course, 
in, in, in the context here, we, we know that God has always been on the throne, but understand the context here, Christ is about to break through the clouds and take uh, and actually set up his earthly kingdom. And so that's why there's this great anticipation of the fact that Christ is going to reign. Now, changing subject here, is anyone too hot? Some of you, no? A few of you there? Heated down, eyes? On? No? Okay, all right. Um, maybe we'll just drop it down one notch. All right, because you're looking a little bit sleepy there, some of you, okay? All right, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. God had been reigning before this point, but this is a special moment where the earth is about to be under his direct rulership for the first time since the fall of man. And uh, this is an amazing thing. So we have the worship before the coming of Christ. A great worship anticipating Christ's coming, Christ's rulership. Number two now, <clears throat> the wedding before his coming, verse 7 through 10. <clears throat> now these words in 7 through 10, <clears throat> or sorry, verse 7 to um, 7 and 8, I should say, verses 7 and 8 are really a continuation of that same worship him, that worship of the Lord. Okay, so it says, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, verse 6, and then it goes right on, let us be glad and rejoice. And give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So there's great celebration here around the bride of Christ. I want to draw your attention to several truths about this wedding that has taken place in heaven. Notice firstly, in verse 7, the gladness at the wedding. The gladness at the wedding. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Now, who is the wife of the Lamb? Anybody know? The church. Let's give you some scripture there to back that up. Ephesians 5, great passage there. We often read it at weddings concerning the relationship between a wife and her husband. But we see the whole picture here of uh, of, uh, of Christ and the church. So marriage, Christian marriage, is a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church. That's why when we get down to the end here at verse 32, it says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Very important you understand who the bride is. The bride is not Old Testament Israel. The bride is not the tribulation saints. The bride is the church age saints. Very important. Let us rejoice and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb is come. Now what's very interesting is that phrase is come is in the aorist tense. That's just the simple past tense. So what this indicates is that the wedding, the marriage has already taken place in heaven. So here, the whole picture here is that there has a wedding has taken place in heaven and now Christ is returning not for his bride, but with his bride. Very important. Christ is returning at his second coming to the earth, not to retrieve his bride, but with his bride. You say, how did the bride get there? Before the second coming. It's called the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture. <laughs> so, well, that's... Uh, <clears throat> it's not clear. Well, if you have blindfolds on, it's not clear. If you have doctrinal error covering your eyes and earplugs in your ears, but the Bible is very clear, Christ at his second advent when he returns to earth is not coming for his bride, he's coming with his bride. Please get that into your mind. Okay, another verse here, I got ahead of myself there. 2 Corinthians 11.2, another verse on the church as the bride of Christ, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, says Paul, for I have espoused, means to be betrothed, or we would use the word engaged perhaps to explain this, you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the, the, the church is the bride of Christ, and it's not just a Baptist bride, I'm sorry. Okay, it's all the redeemed of the church age. Now, as I mentioned, 
this shows us that the wife of the lamb is already in heaven when Christ comes. True? The, 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 the bride is already in heaven. That means that somehow she had to get there before Christ returns to the earth. That's the truth of the rapture. That's the truth of the rapture. At the rapture, Christ comes in the air for his saints, not to the earth. He comes into the air and calls the saints out. He comes for the saints. At the second coming, he comes with his saints, okay, with the saints. So this is very, very powerful proof of the rapture taking place before Christ's return to earth. Now, this is a, a, a very powerful argument in favour of the pre-trib view, as I mentioned. Luke 12, 36 clearly states that Christ returns, quote, from the wedding. <laughs> Christ returns from the wedding. Now, if you believe in this post-trib madness, where you're saying the rapture happens right at the end, at the same time as the second coming, how's the wedding going to take place? Because <laughs> here... The bride's in heaven already. She's coming with him, riding upon the horses there, quite clear. So this is powerful proof, another powerful proof of the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. Christ comes, he snatches away his bride. There's the seven-year tribulation. During that whole time, the bride of Christ is in heaven. By the way, a thought just came to me. If you believe that the church is the bride of Christ, what a what a, what, a, what a terrible picture that would present of Christ to put his bride through the tribulation. That's a ghastly picture, to torture his bride in the tribulation. What would you think of a husband who tortured his wife? You'd say he's an evil husband. The bride of Christ is the delight of the Lamb. He loves her. He's not going to torture her in the fires of the great tribulation. He's coming to rescue her, to take her away. Wonderful truth. His wife hath made herself ready. Now, let me give you a little bit of interesting background here to a Jewish wedding. If you understand <coughs> the customs surrounding a Jewish wedding, it presents a powerful picture of the truths uh, concerning the, the rapture and the second coming. And uh, you may be familiar with some of these, but let me just run through with you what a, 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 a marriage looked like for the Jew. Firstly, <coughs> A marriage contract was drawn up and a dowry paid for the bride. That was the first step. Sometimes the arrangement was made between parents even while the children were young. And when they grew up, they would be married. So there was a marriage contract drawn up and a price was paid for the bride. Then the groom would return to the father's house. At the father's house, he would begin to prepare a place for his bride, a room in his, in, his, in his father's house. At a time only known to the father, not the groom, the groom would be sent to get his bride. So here's the picture. So we have the, the groom-to-be, he comes, he pays the price for his bride. He returns to his father's house and begins to prepare a place for his bride in the father's house. Then at the time appointed to the father, he is sent to get his bride and this would involve a procession, a procession through the streets with blowing of trumpets and the cry and the shout would, be, would go out, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Upon arrival at the bride's house, the groom would stand outside the house and call her forth to meet him. He would not go inside the house. He would stand outside the house and she would come forth to meet him. Something I learned recently, she would then be raised up off the ground in a sedan chair. They used to do that as a sign. Of, you remember how like, they would uh, carry rulers and, uh, and, uh, and different things? So the, the bride would be actually lifted up into the air. Interesting. And carried, not walking, she would be carried to the father's house. And they actually termed this flying to the father's house. At the father's house, the marriage would be consummated in the bridal chamber where the groom and his bride would be hidden away for seven days. Then they would come out of the bridal chamber where the bride would then be presented and the wedding feast would commence. Now, think about this in light of what Christ has done. When Christ came the first time, 
He paid the price for the church's redemption, didn't he? He paid the ransom price. He shed his own blood to purchase us. Where's Christ now? Well, according to John 15, what did he say? I go to prepare a place for you. Where's he now? In the Father's house, preparing a place for us. At the rapture, Christ lifts us into the air and takes us back to the Father's house where the wedding takes place. That's what's pictured here. The wedding has taken place in heaven before Christ returns to the earth. Similar to the Jewish wedding where the bride and groom were hidden away for seven days, the church will be in heaven with Christ, hidden away for the seven year tribulation period. At the end of the tribulation, the church accompanies Christ at his second coming back to earth where the marriage feast will be celebrated. That's the picture. Christ raptures the church. The seven year tribulation period takes place. Then he returns with his bride to the earth to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so it's been summarised for us on this helpful chart you've probably seen before, but let me remind you of it. Okay, we have the church age here. We believe the rapture is what will happen next for the church. Then we have seven years tribulation. I agree with the view that the beam of seat takes place somewhere there because we find the, the bride now fully prepared, clothed and ready to come with her um, bridegroom. So obviously any sort of review of her works is over. Then we have Christ returning to the earth with his bride. We have the 1,000 year reign of Christ. At the end of the 1,000 year reign, we have the great white throne judgment in the lake of fire. We'll talk about this more in our um, subsequent messages. Uh, for the sinner who dies right now without Christ, they go to a place the Bible calls hell or Hades, which is like a temporary prison. It's a place of fiery torment, but it's not the final place of fiery torment. The lake of fire is still future for the lost. Okay, that happens at the end of the thousand year reign. So right now, if you die without Christ, you go to a uh, what is like a temporary lockup, you might say, called hell. And then after the thousand year reign, that's where we have the great white throne judgment we've been talking about where uh, all the dead are raised and stand before the throne of God. And we will preach more about that when we get closer to it. So we have the <clears throat> um, gladness at the wedding. There's great rejoicing over the fact that the bride um, is there in heaven and that, she is, and, that, and that now the wedding feast is about to be enjoyed. Number two, the garment for the wedding. <clears throat> the garment for the wedding. <clears throat> and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, there are two very important truths I want to draw your attention to about the bride's garment. Okay, beautiful picture here of our relationship to Christ. Number one, it is a provided garment. That's very important you understand that. It is a provided garment. You say, what does that mean? Well, in other words, this is not a garment of her own making. This is a garment that has been given her. Notice the wording in the verse there very carefully at the beginning. And to her was, what's that word? Are you there? Verse 8, and to her was granted. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So she's being given this garment to wear. That's a picture of salvation, isn't it? She has been given her wedding dress. Her dress, her, her, her wedding gown there, they're not her own garments, but they are a garment provided for her by a, her heavenly bridegroom. That's a wonderful picture of what it means to become a Christian. Do you know before you're saved, all you are clothed in, spiritually speaking, are the filthy rags of your own righteousness? The Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy Rags. Not only is our sin offensive to God, but our own righteousnesses, our own attempts to be righteous before God are viewed by God as filthy rags. Very confronting, confronting when you study those words. It means that it refers to the menstrual cloth. It's an, it's an abhorrent thing in the eyes of God, our own deeds, our own efforts. But what do we see in the world today? Well, most people are trying to earn their way to heaven, aren't they? 
It's all about them trying to make their own wedding garment, to try and achieve through their own good works uh, some sort of acceptable standing before God. But what you need this morning is not your own garment. You need the garment that only Christ can give. And so the Bible talks about salvation in, in terms of, of clothing. Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. <clears throat> my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me, notice, with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. What you need this morning is the garment of salvation. All you have without Christ are the filthy rags of your own righteousness. All you have are your sins. But when you get saved, when you turn in repentance to Christ and receive the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ, God not only wipes away your sin debt, but He credits to you His perfect righteousness. He takes His righteousness and puts it on you, puts it upon you like a beautiful robe so that now you can stand before Him. What a wonderful picture that is of salvation a provided garment. I've seen an illustration of this at the cross. You remember how the Lord had that seamless robe and uh, the soldiers did not tear the robe, but they, uh, they um, gambled over the robe because of its value. And I see in this a picture of the exchange that took place at the cross for me, where Christ gave me, as it were, his garment. His garment was taken off of him and my sins placed on him. We sing it, don't we? I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. And through salvation, I exchanged my depravity for his purity, my rags for his righteousness, my sin for his salvation, my ugliness for his beauty. At the cross, I received eternal life in place of eternal death, heaven rather than hell, justification rather than damnation. <clears throat> so it is a provided garment to her was granted that she should be right in fine linen, uh, clean and white. It is a pure garment, a pure garment. We have there the words... Um, <clears throat> Um, where are we there? No, verse 8. Um, clean and white. Clean and white. Um, the word clean comes from the Greek word pure. And the word white here is a very interesting word. It, it, it is a word that speaks of a radiant whiteness. A radiant whiteness. In fact, the, the, the Greek word lampros means radiant. Uh, this word was used to describe the gorgeous robe that was put on Christ by Herod. It was a, it was a beautiful robe. They were doing it to mock him, but it was a, a gorgeous robe. That's the, that word gorgeous comes from the same word as the word white. It's the same word used in Acts 10 verse 30 to describe the bright clothing of the angels. So this is a glorious garment, a radiant garment, a beautiful garment garment, a dazzling white garment symbolic of the imputed righteousness of Christ, arrayed in fine linen. The word arrayed means to be clothed. It's the same word used here in Revelation 3.18 to describe a garment that covers nakedness. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, <clears throat> and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. It's the same word and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. <clears throat> now, we have the word white, and I mentioned that, the definition of that. But be careful, please, of the modern versions on this verse, who change this phrase, the righteousness of saints, to the righteous acts or deeds of the saints. Do you see a problem with that? To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white, and they say, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, the righteous works of the saints, or the righteous deeds of the saints. So, for example, the NIV reads, 
uh, fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen, linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. The problem I have with that is that's works. Your garment, in the first part of the verse, simply disproves that definition apart from anything else, apart from the fact I believe the translators of the King James did it correctly. Apart from that, the, the, the first part of the verse should tell you that that translation is wrong because this garment was not something that came about by her own works. It was given to her. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and White, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So this morning, let me encourage you. Are you saved? Do you know the forgiveness that Christ offers? Have you been clothed in the righteousness of Christ? Or are you still in the filthy rags of your own righteousness? Now, I also want to pause here and just make an application that I think is very, very important to today. Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church, isn't it? Christian marriage is a picture, Ephesians 5, of Christ and the church. If you want to get a, a bit of a, a sense of the sort of spirit that should be a part of a Christian wedding, read Revelation 19. Read about this, this, the bride pictured there as a, as a beautiful bride who is, who is arrayed, means to be clothed entirely, to have nakedness covered, clean, pure, White, that's the whole picture of the wedding there. And Christian marriage is intended of God to be a picture of that union between Christ and the church. There is a sense, brethren, where in, in a very real sense, in, in, in a very real sense, every Christian wedding in some way foreshadows and points forward to this great day we're describing. Do you know that? This, this lifts marriage to its highest level. Marriage between a Christian man and a Christian woman in some way, of course imperfectly, but in some way reflects and foreshadows that great future day where there is that union between Jesus Christ and his blood-washed church. Now may I say as an application today that we are seeing a concerning trend in Christendom today where weddings, Christian weddings, rather than having that spirit of holiness, that spirit of purity that foreshadows this great day, weddings today in many Christian circles have been all but overrun by the philosophies and the ideals of the world. How is the bride dressed in glory, as it were? How is she portrayed? She is arrayed. She is clothed in a beautiful white garment that covers her nakedness. No immodesty there. No dancing there. No revealing clothing there. No drinking. I'm just saying as an application here, I think it's, it's worthy that we pause here for a moment as we look at this glorious picture that, that marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. That tells me that Christian weddings that are supposed to reflect that in some way should be permeated with the spirit of holiness and the spirit of purity. Correct? But today we are seeing the world make inroads into Christian weddings to where Christian weddings resemble, it's very hard actually today, to distinguish much difference at all between an unsaved wedding and a Christian wedding. You have the same immodesty rather than dressing up beautifully and modestly for weddings. Today people get undressed like there's no tomorrow for weddings. That is a distorted picture. You are not picturing that beautiful picture of Christ and the church when you do that. The same drinking is in the weddings today. The same dancing is in the wedding today that you find in the world. And I'm just saying this morning, as you, if you can get a sense of this high and holy picture, may I just challenge our young people today, if you're going to get married, Please seek to reflect this picture. Please seek to reflect a beautiful and a Christ honouring and a holy picture. Amen. I don't know who that was for, for, for exactly. Maybe Dan Williams and Anna. But anyway, um, for all of you, but I'm just saying as an application here, there's, there's an issue here, isn't there? 
where marriage is supposed to picture that holy relationship between Christ and the church. And we see the breakdown of that, don't we? By the way, you mess with marriage, you're messing with God's picture. You mess with God's institution of marriage and you tamper with it and you promote divorce Christian style and you promote all sorts of worldly philosophies, you are tampering with that picture that is supposed to be a reflection of Christ in the church. And to think today that there are people who claim to be Christians who are endorsing perverted marriages of two people of the same gender and saying that somehow that is a reflection of Christ is unspeakably abominable. It is unspeakably evil. It is wicked. And we're not ashamed to say that from this pulpit. We don't hate individuals, but we hate that sin. And we hate that picture, that distorted picture that is being promoted today. That is no reflection of the beautiful, wholesome picture of Christ and the church. So there you go. There's a little bit of extra preaching thrown in there, but I felt impressed about that. It's just tragic today what we're seeing even in Bible-believing circles to where you just about have to go to a wedding blindfolded because it's so inappropriate and so disgusting. That is nothing like the picture we see here. It's not a reflection of Christ. And if you have been engaged in that, then you should repent. <laughs> you say, Pastor, I was unsaved before I was, before I was married. Okay. I'm sure the Lord will have mercy. You didn't understand, but God have mercy on you if you're a Christian and you're going to turn your wedding into a dance party and a drink party and a get undressed party and all the rest of it. It is absolutely wicked. All right. Moving on from there, the guests at the wedding. The guests at the wedding. Verse 9 and 10. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called. There's an invitation here. Unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And of, thy brethren that they, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. <clears throat> the guests at the wedding. Now, who are the invited guests, do you think? That's an interesting thought. Have you thought about that? We have, uh, let's, let's get the picture here of this, of this wedding celebration. We have... The, the bridegroom, who's that? Stay with me now. The bridegroom is Christ. Who's the bride? Who are the guests? Hmm? Yep. Old Testament saints. Okay. Tribulation saints. Very, very interesting. They're not a part of the bride. They're guests. You remember John the Baptist? He wasn't a part of the bride. He called himself the friend of the bridegroom. That's because he was in the old dispensation still. Okay? So the, uh, the guests, we believe, are the saved of other dispensations, of other ages. Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints, suggestion, possibly angels as well. I'm not going to say for sure, but possibly. So we have the bride, that's the church. The tribulation saints, they're not a part of the bride. They're the guests to the wedding feast. The Old Testament saints, they are not a part of the bride. They are the guests to the wedding feast. You say, well, that sounds like you're putting other Christians or other believers from other ages in second categories, in a second, secondary category. Well, this is a high honour. If you got an invitation to a royal wedding, imagine if you got that, you received a a uh, invitation to attend one of the royal weddings. You probably wouldn't go because they're so wicked and everything now anyway. But just follow the illustration for me. That would be an honour, wouldn't it? You would not say, I feel second rate because I'm not the bride. I feel second rate, I'm not the bridegroom. To be invited to attend a royal wedding would be a high honour and privilege. That's the picture. The saints of other ages are invited as guests 
to to participate in and to view the the uh, the um, marriage supper of the Lamb. <clears throat> But you know, I do think we get a sense here that there is something very special about the bride. You have to just accept that this is the ways of God. God does not treat, in a sense, the believers of all dispensations exactly the same. Now, the salvation's the same. Salvation's the same whether you're in the Old Testament, whether you're in the church age, whether you're in the tribulation uh, uh, age. But the point is God, God deals with uh, different groups of people at different times in in different ways, those administrations. There's something very special, isn't there, about the bride. It's like the guests are there to view the bride and to, and to rejoice with the whole thing that's going on there. You know, I really wish, as God's people, we could really get a grip of what it means to be a part of the church. That fell dead. I really wish... As God's people, we knew what it was to get a grip of what it means to be a part of the church, the bride of Christ. It's like the, the church is Christ's crowning achievement. Think about it. The Old Testament was saints were saved looking forward to Christ, but think about it. Christ came and he died on the cross and he shed his blood to purchase the church. Amazing, amazing truth and uh, something so grand and glorious. So the, the guests at the marriage supper here are not the church. They are the saints of other ages. Now, just pause for a minute and imagine. Do you ever stop and imagine? <laughs> I know Seth does. <clears throat> he has very colourful dreams. <clears throat> I hear. Can you imagine for a moment what this is going to be like? Think about it. Because we need, to, we need to try and let these truths sink in. This is not, we're not talking here about a nice warm fairy story. If you're saved, you're going to be there. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to sit down with the saved of all the ages? To sit down with, to celebrate Christ's work of redemption. Imagine sitting down for fellowship with heroes of the faith like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Samuel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, John the Baptist, the Apostles. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the celebration? Can you imagine the joy, the fellowship, the glory that's going to be given to our Lord Jesus? You know, I think maybe we get a little foretaste of how we, we may react by John's response in verse 10. John was overwhelmed by this. This is, I find this amazing. All through the book of Revelation, John has seen amazing things. He's seen powerful things, glorious things. We don't find him falling on his knees when he saw the Antichrist riding on his horse. <laughs> we don't find John responding, responding in, this, in, in this sort of dramatic way until he sees the bride the bride and the lamb. And that is what overwhelmed him so. And he fell down at the feet of the angel who was revealing these things to him to worship him. Now John's response was in a sense a good one, but he erred in this respect. He was not to worship the angel. And the angel promptly forbids him, says, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus kind of does away with the Catholic idea of praying to angels, doesn't it? Mm. We don't pray to angels. That's satanic. <laughs> and that's unbiblical. Uh, because if you're praying to an angel so-called, you might be praying to a demon. There's a lot of fallen angels out there. But it's significant what the angel says to him. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, he says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's a key statement, isn't it? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Christ is the theme of all the scriptures, isn't he? But he's especially the theme of prophecy. You say, what's prophecy all about? It's all about Christ. Revealing his glory, 
his character. Think, just think for a moment. I hope you've learned something through the series so far. Think about the sort of truths we've been exposed to through the book of Revelation. Imagine if we neglected Bible prophecy in this church. Do you know when you neglect Bible prophecy, do you know what the most tragic thing about that is? You're neglecting a whole part of, re of the revelation of Christ, who he is. There's so much to learn about Christ through prophecy. And to not preach prophecy is to not preach Christ in his fullness and his entirety as revealed in the scriptures. Sadly today, many churches do just that. Don't touch the book of Revelation. Won't touch prophetic scripture. They're actually cutting themselves short of so much wonderful revelation of Christ. John Woolward says this, he says, how poverty stricken is any theology that minimises the second coming of Christ and how limited the hope that does not include this glorious climax to God's program of exalting his son and putting all creation under his control. Well, as we conclude this morning's message, the first question for you is this, have you been clothed in the righteousness of Christ? Have you been born again? Have you been saved? Or are you still clothed in your own rags? Are you a part of the bride of Christ? Our expectancy is, based on the word of God, we're going to be caught up in the rapture. If you're not a part of that bride, you would be left behind. So the challenge for you today is, are you saved? Are you a true Christian? Do you know Christ? Let's bow for prayer.